Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to be here for you, to spend time with you, Lord. But Lord, more importantly, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be here on the Sabbath day in your house, Lord, to worship you with all the angels. Lord, it's amazing that we are worshiping on the Sabbath together, not just here on earth, Lord, but all of heaven is worshiping today. And so thank you for this awesome blessing, Lord. Jesus, I ask that you would please be with each and every person here, that you would just remove the powers of darkness from this place, any distractions that may be lingering. Please, Lord, I pray you would escort them out. And Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon each one of us, that you would touch each of our hearts, and that this message would not only, Lord, be heard, but that we would act that we would be motivated by your Holy Spirit to do the Word of God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, my first question is, what do you guys think about when you think of, when you hear the words religious liberty? I know for me, what comes to my mind, I think about my upbringing and so forth, and Basically, religious liberty was only taught, it was only really brought up in schools and stuff, and I think it's pretty much the case for at least most people. So when I think of religious liberty, I think of the Constitution. I think of America, because I know that um, America was built on religious freedom, right? And our Constitution, by the divine handiwork of God, protects that right. Isn't that so? But today, we are going to look at religious liberty from a little bit different perspective, and I think it's going to be exciting. We're going to learn how to have it and how to maintain it. Excuse me. And so with that being said, our title is Of Lawyers and Witnesses. You know, every one of us is to be an ambassador for Christ, right? But that includes religious liberty. Each one of us should be an ambassador for religious liberty. All of us have been called to do that. If we are Christians... If we're sitting here, I, I, I assume we're all Christians. Maybe there's some out there that are seeking and checking out Christianity. Thank you for being here if that's the case. But we are all called to be ambassadors for religious liberty. I want to show you a powerful statement here. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. You see, Jesus needs us. Now, does he really need us? I mean, the Lord could do all the work without us. He can send the angels down and the work could be done in a lickety split, right? But the reality is, Jesus created us with intimacy. You know, he spoke everything into existence except for man. He got down and got in the dirt, and he was intimate with us. He formed us with his bare hands and breathed in the breath of life. And man became a living soul, right? Therefore... Jesus wants to use us. He loves us so much that he wants to use us as broken and as sinful as we are. He wants to use us. Don't ever forget that. Today we're having a religious liberty rally, if you haven't noticed. Um, Every one of you is important in this proclamation of freedom of conscience and this message that we're about to hear today. Um, Liberty Magazine, have you guys heard of that? Liberty Magazine? Okay. Well, I encourage each one of you Now, last Sabbath, we started taking up offering for that, as well as this Sabbath, and I believe we're going to do one more, for those of you that haven't been able to do that yet. That being said, Religious Liberty, the Liberty Magazine, is going to every thought leader in the country. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I started learning more about this. By the way, this is my first year being Religious Liberty leader, so I'm still learning about it myself. Um, But it's important to remember that This magazine is going out to each and every thought leader, judges, senators, um, all the hierarchies of the government, okay? And this is powerful because they have the opportunity to learn the truth on religious liberty, and they get to make a decision whether they're going to uphold it or not, correct? This is important. Did you know that each one of you is a thought leader? You don't have to be in government. All you need to be is a living, breathing soul. And you get the choice to be a Christian and to really stand up for religious liberty, right? 
You know, we're in a time now, we're in the closing hours. We know that Jesus is coming soon. Do you believe that? I absolutely do. And we know that right now is day. Right now is the daytime. In other words, now is the time that we have the freedom openly to share God's word with people, to stand up for religious liberty, right? But we know, inspiration tells us, and the Bible tells us, that night is coming. There is a dark time coming where we're not going to be able to do this freely and openly. We're going to have to uh, be a little more creative about it, if you will. So let's take advantage of the day while we still have it. You know, we depend upon attorneys and lawyers. We just heard some testimonies this morning where our religious system has actually gone to work for people. And I want to thank Donna, and I want to thank you, sir, for your testimony as well. These are very powerful testimonies, friends. God is at work if we are willing to stand for him, right? But we have lawyers and attorneys, thankfully, that are willing to go to bat for religious liberty, to stand up for you. You know, and by the way, if there's anybody else here struggling with religious liberty in the sense of whether it be keeping the Sabbath or whatever it may be, um, as your religious liberty leader, or you can go to Brandon Quarter, of course, the pastor, but come see us and we can get you into the hands of the right people to help you with these things legally, but also, more importantly, prayerfully. So I want to go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 today is the Good Samaritan. I believe most of you know this, right? This is a really powerful story. And when I've read this story several times, I've never come across it the way I did this time. It's pretty amazing when you look at it in the context of religious liberty. So I want to go here beginning in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit, inherit eternal life, right? Now, this story regarding an attorney is focused on human rights where religious liberty is a prime focal point. This is really cool. Again, I never saw this before, but I, I've seen it, and it's really nice. So let's just check this out. Um, notice how Jesus responds. What does Jesus say here? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? How do you think Jesus responded? Do you think he jumped at the man and said, well, come on, don't you know? Or do you think he hit him over the head with Scripture? No, he didn't, right? He could have. But Jesus, here's the key. We can respond just as peacefully and loving as Christ. You know, Jesus had a connection with his Father. We see that in the Gospels very clearly, right? He took time to pray with the Father. He took time to connect with him all the time. He even had to sneak away from his disciples at times to make time for his Father Lord, um, I want to encourage you guys, I urge you, please be a part of a revival and reformation in your own walk with the Lord. You know, you might hear this from me quite a bit, and I'll be honest with you, it can't be overstated, but the relationship with Jesus is absolutely crucial, it's essential, okay? Taking time with Jesus every day, building your own connection, reading the Bible, spirit of prophecy, and prayer each and every day, friends. We, want to, we won't be saved by groups. We won't even be saved by our pastors. We will not be saved by our spouses, okay? We have to take an individual stand for the Lord, Amen. okay? You know, our relationship with Jesus, as I said, is the key. You know, it's this daily walk that I've talked about before, but Jesus talks about it more. And it's taking time, starting your day with the Lord, okay? You know, some people work nights, some people work days, but whenever your day begins, begin it with Christ. Take time to pray and read. Spend a good time with Him, a good hour with Him. I don't know what that time looks like for you, but I encourage you to spend more than five minutes with the Lord, really. If you do that, your entire day is going to change, I promise you. Um, this is what I have experienced, and as a result, the Lord continues to work and change in my life, changing me, I should say. He doesn't change, but I do as a result of Him. So getting back to the story here, this attorney tested Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Great question, isn't it? You know, I've heard of things uh, over the years of, well, the science is coming out with this drug that if you take this pill, they think they might have finally found a cure to live forever. It's out there. It's in the tabloids, right? What about a perfect diet? 
Should we eat it? Should we be eating the biblical diet? We should, right? Honestly, but is that going to save us in and of itself? No, it's going to prolong our life. It'll give us abundance of life, but it's not going to give us eternal life. So, what is our job as Christians, as ambassadors for Jesus Christ and religious liberty? We are to take this answer to people. What is the answer? We need to take Jesus, or excuse me, take the people of Jesus, the cross. The cross is where Jesus gave his life for each one of us, right? Jesus is the one that gives us eternal life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? That's the answer we should be sharing, friends. And I encourage and hope that each one of us are when the opportunity arises. So, Jesus said to him, what is written in the law in verse 26, right? Well, let's go to verse 27. And notice what he says here. Jesus answered, love, excuse me, the lawyer answered and said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, is that a new commandment? Does that replace the Ten Commandments? No, it does not. And, but yet many out there are saying that. I've heard this myself. You know, the first ten, the ten Commandments, if you look at this first part of the verse here, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. This is simply the first four commandments. You know, I, if we just go off of this, if we just go off of this new commandment alone, what, is, what does love even look like? It just says to love. But what does that look like? The first four commandments tell us how to love Jesus Christ, right? Which, by the way, I love how God puts that first because without loving him first, it's impossible to love your neighbor. The last six of the commandments, love your neighbors as yourself. This is how we love our neighbor, okay? So God gives us a beautiful description of what love looks like. We don't have to guess at it, friends. And so let's go to verse 28 here. Notice here it says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Did it say take this pill and you will live? Eat the perfect diet and you will live? No, it says do this and you will live. Just as he stated in verse 27, do this. In other words, keep the commandments. Now, reading that in and of itself, you might say, hey, I knew it. Legalism. All we got to do is just Keep the commandments and we'll be saved. That's what they're preaching. But here's the thing, guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we read this in full context, which you don't have time to do the entire, in its entirety today, we would know that Jesus is talking about this is the expression and fruits of a conversion with Jesus Christ, right? You see, keeping the commandments of God is literally impossible, really, unless we are connected with the Lord genuinely through a born-again experience, okay? Amen. It can't be done any other way. Um, so I just want to share that with you, that the importance of keeping the commandments is not legalism. It is simply an outworking of God working in your life. Now let's go to verse 29 here. Notice here it says, but he wanted to justify himself. Now, this is interesting to me. I always over, I, I, I've always overread this in the past, but, but he wanted to justify himself. Have you guys ever wanted to justify yourself? I have. I don't know how many times I've done it, you know, inadvertently and even intentionally at times. Um, notice here Jesus, or excuse me. Yeah, Jesus says, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, I have a question. Did the lawyer know who his neighbor was? You think he knew who his neighbor was? I believe he did. He was a lawyer. Certainly he knew who his neighbor was. I mean, now how often do we like to justify ourselves? We, we, we try to rationalize things, right? Um, there is a word in that particular text that I want to share, talk about a little bit here. And... It's a very simple word. It's called but. It begins B-U-T in the beginning there. But he wanted to justify. So I'll give you an example. I love how the pastor preached today. He's an outstanding pastor. He speaks well. He's friendly. 
but. Or, I love how the elder is so interactive with people and he's always active in the church, but. What about our Sabbath school teacher? Whatever, you fill in the blanks, but, right? You know, if we took that word out of our replies when it regards to other people and God's work, far more would be accomplished. Think about that. If we would just focus on the good of people and completely forget about the bad, because all of us have bad, right? All of us have things we're working on, including myself. So let's just focus on edifying people, building up people in a Christian way, right? You know, what is our greatest challenge today that we face in the church? A holocaust? Persecution? Well, it may be a combination of the both, but is that our greatest challenge? You know, we know those things will be coming at some level, but that is not our greatest challenge. Our greatest challenge, believe it or not, is self. Self is our greatest challenge. This actually was kind of mind-boggling to me when I first learned that, because I thought, well, how, how could that be? Satan's the, he's the founder of all this stuff. I mean, how could it be self? But the reality of it is, because of our Savior, because of God, or excuse me, because of Satan, we were contaminated by sin, and therefore, as a result, oftentimes, we do a pretty good job destroying people and ourselves without Satan, really. Um, so self is always in the way. Let's go to verse, or back to verse 29 there and just reflect on that. Notice he said, but he wanted to justify himself. So, do you think the lawyer was being academic? Do you think he was trying to be intellectual? Well, I think he was, actually. He knew who the neighbor was, but he was trying to be academic. Is academics a bad thing? No, of course not. But, but choosing to... But choosing to use academics and intellect to rationalize truth, now that's a problem, right? That's where we get into problem. And this is what the lawyer was stepping into. But you know what? Jesus responds with a phenomenal story. And, of course, it's the great Samaritan, or the, the excuse me, the good Samaritan. And I want to tell you something. I also learned this, that did you know that that story is not a parable? is actually true. Is that amazing? Desire of Ages points this out. Let's go there. First, we'll read it in the verse. Verse 30 says, In reply, Jesus said, And was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, let's go to Desire of Ages here. Page 499, it says, This was no imaginary scene but an actual occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented. That's pretty incredible. Now get this, this gets even better. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side, which we're going to be reading about here shortly, were in the company that listened to Christ's words. They were sitting there. This had already happened, obviously, because Jesus is telling the story, but just picture this for a minute. These guys are sitting there. They experienced this, and here they are sitting there hearing Jesus' words about this. Going on here, it says, In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveler had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea. Now notice the condition of this road. The road led down a wild, rocky ravine which was infested by robbers and was often the scene of violence. So, think about the road that he went through. It was wild and rocky. It was narrow. It was dark. Isn't that how Satan likes to work? He likes to get in the dark, narrow crevices of our life. And when we least expect it, he wants to pounce on us. He wants to rob us. He does, doesn't he? This, start, this story goes far greater than what we're actually looking at here. You know, the very people in that story, as we just talked about, I'm just amazed by the fact that these people heard Jesus talking about that story. That's still, that's still amazing to me. You know, it is important to understand in the context of religious liberty, that the person robbed and beaten was a Jewish person. Okay, this will contrast with the person who helped him. Now, if you guys remember me preaching here last, or this last October, three months ago, almost to the day, um, I talked about Jews and Samaritans, right? Do you, remember, do you guys remember the fact that the Jews absolutely hated the Samaritans? 
They really did. They were, they were straight up prejudiced. In fact, if you recall, I shared that little story about the woman at the well where the Jews would go literally out of their way to avoid this class of people. So notice here, going on in the story, in verse 31, we're going to read. This is amazing. A priest happened to be going down the same road, or shall I change that to pastor? And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Have mercy, right? Think about this. The pastor of a church, the most, hopefully, it should be the most trusted person in the government of a church, right? That's what God put him in place for. In fact, they are supposed to be... Now, okay, let me back up just for a second here. Pastors are not supposed to be perfect, okay? We're not looking for perfection in a pastor. But they are held to a higher accountability. So one of the things that should, they should be good at or striving to be better at is meeting the care of people physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually, which, by the way, in Mount of Blessings, page 143, I believe you can read that that is Christ's method alone, Right? That's going to be the most successful in reaching people. You know, by God's grace, may we not be one of those Christians that sees somebody in need and we skirt on by. You know, oftentimes we get too busy in this world, don't we? I do. I get caught up at times at work and sometimes I'll see opportunities, but I'm looking at the clock and I'm you don't even really think about it. You just kind of do it. I'm guilty of that. Okay, I do that at times. I don't want to keep doing that. I do get opportunities and I do share, but I could do it more often. I'm just being honest, friends. Cares of this world, you know, the cares of this world, as I've mentioned before, doesn't always necessarily happen intentionally. Sometimes it's inadvertently. Our intentions are good. We're doing good things. In fact, is it possible to be too busy in the church? Is it possible to be so busy with ministries that we neglect our own personal relationship with Christ? It, of course it is. We can do that, and guess what, friends? We can be just as lost as the atheist. We really can be in the church. Let's go to verse 32. So, so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So now here's, now who's a Levite? A Levite is basically somebody like a Sabbath school teacher, a deacon, elder maybe. So another leader of the church, right? Notice what he did. He at least came to check out the problem. He at least came to see. Now, at times, how many of us in times past have we seen, again, this isn't necessarily intentional, but how many times have we looked at a problem from afar and say, well, look at all those people. They're just standing there. Well, here you are just standing there, right? I mean, there's all these examples that we can give. And we move on because we assume somebody else is going to help, right? Somebody else will come by. But again, have mercy on us as Christians if that's what we do. You know, this man's rights, his human rights, have been violated, right? This Jewish man has been violated. At least, at least the Levite took the time to look. You know, what an indictment for the church or for us if we're not in fully God's hands, right? And, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. If we're not connected with Jesus Christ, and again, that's spending time with the Lord, taking time to spend with him. You know, it's no different than any other relationship. If I want a relationship with my wife, my children, my mom, you pick the person. It requires time, Right? Jesus is not exempt from that, nor are we exempt from him, just because he's no longer physically walking the earth anymore. He still asks for us to give him our time. Let's go to verse 33 here. Now, this is where the story gets really cool. Now, this was our, the beginning of our scripture reading, so going on here, it says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him... Look at that. He took pity on him. Now, this Samaritan is hated by this guy. It's a Jewish person that's beaten and robbed. The Samaritan who's hated is the one that stops. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not the pastor and not the Sabbath school teacher. That's very sad. Going on here, 
The Samaritan didn't hesitate. He wasn't thinking and saying things like, well, it's not a good situation. It's dangerous. I could get hurt. Now, we need to use our heads, I believe. But at the same time, if we are really walking with the Lord and we're connected with him, Jesus will protect us in all situations, right? The Lord's going to use his people. He wasn't worried about getting robbed or beaten. He stopped by immediately. He also wasn't thinking, I wonder what race he is. Or, I wonder what social economic status he is. He makes too much money. I, nah, he can help himself. You know, he's always getting all the, he's the one taking all the taxes from us and everything else. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. Or maybe it's the opposite way. Maybe he's a person that makes too little. Maybe you feel above that person. A person stinks or they don't drive a nice car. I don't know. These are all things that creep around in the minds of sinful human beings. It's just a reality, friends. What about this? Will I get something out of it? Hey, if I help him, he makes a lot of money. Maybe he'll give me a big reward. Really? Is that possible? Is it possible that we could be thinking those things at times? If we're not connected to Jesus, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. What language does he speak? Well, I might not be able to understand him, so how can I truly help him? There's a powerful story coming up talking about that too, by the way. So what motivated the Samaritan to help his enemy? Well, he was driven by the power of the Holy Spirit and understood true human rights. Okay? He jumped into action and obeyed God's commandments, listen, without thinking. I have a question. What do we do without thinking, without the connection of Christ? Hurt other people. Again, it's not always blatantly and direct and intentional, but we can't help it. Sinners, if we're not connected to Jesus, we're going to hurt other people, right? If we are not fully connected to Jesus, we will be thinking, or without thinking, we will be doing harm to people because we're sinful, right? We're sinful people. Our sinful nature without thinking is to seek sin, to look for sin. Even if we hate it, we still seek it. I know this from my past experiences in alcohol and other things. But guess what happens when we submit to God and we resist the devil guess what happens when we fully submit to him and have that relationship with him each and every day we take time you know so often in this world and I look at my own life when I used to go you know I used to ride dirt bikes and party and all these things and you know what it didn't matter how hard I worked I made time I was going to get that partying in I deserved it I earned it. That's what I was thinking, right? That was my justification, by the way, for what I was doing. But I made time for it. As Christians, why can't we make time with Jesus Christ each and every day? Amen. Guess what happens when we do? Amen. Our new natural is going to be like the Samaritan. We will have a new heart. Therefore, we will be able to have a new natural desire and reaction and acting out God's commandments on people. God first, of course, right? The first four commandments is speaking about how to love God. And of course, the last six, we're going to act out as a Samaritan. Now, get this. It's going to get even better because this is at the end. Check this out. If the clicker will work. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three things do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And we know if we go on reading, the, the, the lawyer says the one who had compassion on him, right? In fact, it's interesting that he didn't even use the word Samaritan. He just said the one... He recognized the actions, the one who had compassion, right? Isn't that interesting? So look at that extent there. 
Now, oftentimes we might help somebody, but how far would we really go to help somebody? You know, I, I could go a lot further than what I have done, certainly. But this is a powerful display of what it looks like to live out the commandments of God, i.e., the relationship, the fruit of Christ when we are connected with him. Now, what a manifestation of true Christian character to see this played out here. In fact, I would call that religious freedom, would you not? That's the most awesome experience of religious freedom that I can see in the Bible so far. You know, again, as I was saying in the beginning of my, my sermon here, the first thing that comes to my mind was legals, legals of the world, constitution, religious freedom, those kinds of things. And I'm thankful we have those, but this is, Jesus is actually the center of religious freedom. Think about this. When we, are, when we are so connected with Jesus that we are free from the ways and popular thinking, notice the popular thinking of the world, that sinful nature, which is, by the way, a manifestation of self, Satan, and sin, right? So we want to be free from the bondages of sin, correct? That's our only hope is Jesus Christ to, to be able to do that. You see, in this story, we are the Jewish man, robbed and beaten, and Jesus is the Samaritan. The one who was hated and rejected and still stopped to take, to take care of you and me. And he still does, doesn't he? You know, eventually the Samaritan moves on, but Jesus never moves on, does he? He's always with us, waiting to help us. You know, I want to see, let's, let's look at this powerful statement here from Desire of Ages. Page 504. Now this is a bold, this is a bold statement, and yet it's true, friends. We've got we've to hear this. The lesson is no less needed in the world today than when it was, fell from the lips of Jesus. Selfishness, notice that's the word, first word that comes here, our greatest challenge. Selfishness and cold formality have well nigh or near extinguished the fire of love and dispelled the graces that should make fragrant the character. Many who profess his name have lost sight of the fact that Christians are to represent Christ, right? Amen. Amen. Unless there is a practical self-sacrifice for the good of others in the family circle, in the neighborhood, I'll add in the workplace, you fill in the blank, in the church, and wherever we may be, then whatever our profession we are not Christians. And that's a painful statement, honestly. If you, I mean, for some people it can be. Um, you know, because we know that the Christian world at large, they don't understand. You know, and again, I want to be compassionate here because not everybody knows this truth yet. And so everybody that's calling themselves Christians, you know, hopefully they are. Hopefully they're, they're, they're learning and living up to the truths that they're learning, Okay. But the reality is, this is the real test. Jesus says in the Bible, oh, I'm trying to remember how it goes now. The Lord just gave this to me. But this is how they will know that you are Christians by the love that you have for one another, right? Amen. That's the Ten Commandments being acted out, friends. So, I have a story that happened to me about a week and a half ago. I was at work. There's my truck. Now, I, let's see, I've got to explain this to you because I did not fall asleep, okay? This isn't my first day doing this. So this is at a job site in Quincy, and you'll see right here, I just pulled out to look over some more directions on my next run. Now, if you see right here, all that nice gravel, and again, I've been stuck a time or two, and so it looked pretty solid to me. That's a whole different sermon, by the way. Making sure we're on solid ground, right? <laughs> but if you'll see here, I'm out in the road still. But you'll see right here, the minute my truck, the steer tires got off the asphalt, this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, these, with the clay around here, but if it, it's, it's worse than ice. I mean, I'd rather be in snow, honestly. You can't get traction on it to save your life. But I didn't know that first entering it, so this is what happened. The truck literally, when I hit this part here, as you can see, 
that it was like I was just shoved, like somebody pushed me into the ditch. And it was a deep ditch. And you can't see the details, but I was up to the axle on my other side there. Why do I share this with you? Because I'm sitting there, and about five minutes later, and again, it's obviously there's a problem. I didn't, you know, get creative and try to pull off the road that way. There's a problem here. Well, in the first five minutes of sitting there, I had several people drive by. Now, I'm preparing for the sermon, guys, right? And I'm thinking to myself, there goes the priest. <laughs> right? And then I even had guys slow down and rubberneck. There goes the Levite. <laughs> and then, praise the Lord, I thought, okay, Lord, there's got to be a Samaritan. And there was. And I got to tell you guys, I've had, I've had help before. And normally, I call a tow truck. And in fact, you're probably wondering why I took these pictures, but because if I ever have to call a tow truck, it's a pretty expensive bill. I always got to show to them and justify why I called. And they're cool about it. They don't worry about it. They just, they just want it for corporate reasons. But the point is, I was about ready to call, and a guy stopped in his pickup, dead in his tracks on the road, and he doesn't hardly speak any English, okay? His name is Albert. He lives right out there in Quincy. And he stops, and he goes, now, I'm going to speak this to you to where you can understand, because I couldn't understand him, so try to keep that in mind. But he goes, you need help? And I said, well, yeah, I'm stuck. And he goes, and he points across the field, which is actually out that way, about a mile or so, you can see a blue building. He says, you see blue building? And I said, yeah, I see blue building. And now I, I, I have a hard time understanding him, but I'm making out just enough details to understand what he's saying. And so he says, well, I got tractor. He goes, I'll be back five minutes. Okay, now the whole time he stopped, from the time he rolled his window down, he had a smile from ear to ear. Okay? No, really, this, is ama this was divine. I, I, I kid you not. I think the Lord gave me this for the story, honestly. Because he had a smile ear to ear. He was excited. And he said again, I'll be back five minutes. He made sure that nobody else came to help me. He wanted to help me. And I said, okay, I promise I won't call anybody. And so he takes off, and this blue building is it's across the field about a mile as the crow flies. And so he's already having to go out of his way. He didn't have to stop. So he's, he heads to his house. He comes back. Now, at five minutes, he's not there. I'm thinking, uh-oh. Maybe I should have waved somebody down or called the tow truck. And so he finally comes back about 10 minutes later. And we hook up to the front. We pull it out. No big deal. We get pulled over to the other side of the road there. And... Uh, I wanted to make sure he wasn't going to just take off. I wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to thank him right, you know, in the right way. And so he pulled over, I pulled over, I helped him take the chain off his tractor, and I said, thank you. I said, God bless you. You have no idea how much this means to me. And he's just full of joy and excited, right? And I said, are you a Christian? And he goes, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. And I said, are you a Christian? No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. So I don't know what he thought I was saying. Again, it was much, much worse than what I'm, you're hearing me say it, um, as far as his responses. And I just said, well, okay, I don't know. I think, he, I, I believe he's a Christian, guys, honestly. I don't know that, but I believe he is based on the fruit, okay? Yeah. Now, I said, well, I'm out here a lot. Maybe I'll see you again. He goes, you got phone? I said, yeah, I got phone. And I put his name in there. He goes, take my name and number. And he roughly explained to me, if you have any more problems out here, call me. So I now have Albert in my work phone. So I'll call him before I call Randy's towing. <laughs> and you know, what's so, you know what's so special about that? You know how music has no barriers? Neither does the fruit of Christ. I couldn't understand what he was saying completely. And he could understand me completely. But you know what? We recognize each other's fruit. And that's what spoke. Now, in closing, I got one more story I want to tell you. Very powerful. There's a lady by the name of Tashiana. She lives in Asia. She's a lawyer. And 
one of her jobs is, she's also, I think she was a mayor also, if I'm not mistaken. But one of her jobs there in that country, in order for anybody to get building materials, she's one of the people that's got to sign off for the building materials. And so this gentleman, this pastor from a church came and he wanted to get some bricks and she needed to sign off on it in order for him to get them. And so she said, no, 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 I'm too busy. I, I can't do that right now. Come back. He says, okay, I'll come back. And he comes back and again, I'm too busy. Come back. And by the way, praise the Lord, don't ever lose patience with people. You know, when I first came... Well, when I, before I started Bible studies, my Bible worker, Marcus Harden at the time, he came back three times. I told him no the first two times. Guess what happens? The pastor goes back a third time, and she says, you know what? I don't have time for this. I'm just going to sign it and get you out of my face. Praise the Lord, right? Because the pastor got the brick he needed. Now, maybe not praising the Lord for her attitude, but she at least, she at least got him the materials he needed. Now, Tashiana has a son who is turning 17. And she appro or he approached her and said, Mom, I want to spend time with you on your birthday. Or on my birthday, excuse me. And she goes, well, I'm kind of busy. I'll just give you some money or something. And he goes, no, I want to spend time with you, Mom. Well, so where do they go? She finally gives in and says, okay, fine. She goes to church with him. And guess what? They sit down. They have a nice afternoon at the church. They hear a powerful sermon on Christ. And the pastor made an offering appeal. And she was shocked to see that her son stood up and accepted the appeal to get baptized. And so he goes forward, gets baptized. And, well, before he gets baptized, I went to jump ahead there. But he, went to, he accepted the call for baptism. And... They go to the river later that afternoon. Forgive me, I'm trying to remember the story completely in detail. Yeah, they go to the river that afternoon, and she sees him and the pastor down there by the river kind of waving their arms, not in a bad way, but you could tell they were having a conversation. And so he comes running back before he gets dipped, and he says, Mama, Mama, you can get baptized too. The pastor said you can get baptized. And she's thinking, huh? I don't know anything about what why would I get baptized? I don't know anything about this. And he goes, please, Mom, it's my birthday. <laughs> she got baptized. <laughs> now, is that exactly, is that, we don't want to promote that. I want to be clear right now. We should get to know Jesus a little bit and know what we're committing ourselves to, right? But do you think God can work with food? Yeah. Yeah. Thank God, right? Yeah. Well, guess what happens? They go and get baptized together. And when she comes out of the water, they come out of the water both. They said, well, we got to hire our baptismal certificates because in this country, the culture was that if the husband and father didn't know about it or you have a part or a play in the decision making, there is painful consequences to say the least. And so they said, well, we're going to hide these certificates. Well, five months later, the son came to her and said, Mama, Mama, Papa found the certificates. And she goes, well, don't worry, son, I'll take care of this. And so she goes and speaks to her husband, and he says, how could you do this? You know, you didn't talk to me about this. Not only are you baptized, my son's baptized, and this is just wrong. And she stops, and she remembers the Bible speaking about the fact, do not worry about what to say in that hour when leaders and kings and potentates will ask you the reason you have for the hope that is in you, right? Yeah. It's necessarily in those words, but you guys follow along with me. And she remembered that, and she goes, well, dear husband, if I have been worse, if I have been more unloving, if I have been a lesser of a mom, more unhappy, worse at all these things, then I will leave this faith immediately. But she says, dear husband, if I, have been become, if I have become in the last five months a more loving wife, a more loving mother, a happier person, then please take this into consideration before you make your decision. 
So even in that moment, her fruits were of Christ, right? And he goes, no, you definitely are not worse. You have only improved my wife. And long story short, he ends up reading, oh, I got to share this real quick. After she got baptized and before it got to this point, she finally realized, I should probably uh, find out what I got baptized into. So she started studying the Bible. She put the cart before the horse and praise the Lord, it worked, right? But she started studying the Bible and reading a great controversy and she got led up to this point, got baptized. And now her husband, as a result of this story or this confrontation she had, uh, he ended up reading the great controversy because of her fruits. And he became a baptized Bible-following Christian too. So why do I share that story? Because again, today is about religious liberty. Today, and of course, if anybody was here for my last sermon, I talked about the importance based on the Bible, the importance of verbally sharing the Word of God. We need to do that. Let's not, let's not try to substitute verbal sharing of Christ with actions alone. We got to do both, friends. But in this particular case, we're talking about the fruit and how the fruit reveals Christ in combination with words. And so each of us, regardless of our situation or station in life, can be a powerful witness to God. We are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. No matter how old or young all of you are, it is our it is, it is our part of this, we are part of this, excuse me, <laughs> no matter how young or old all of us are, we are to be a part of this great proclamation of Christ's soon coming, of the freedom of conscience and the power of choice that he has given to each one of us, right? You know, I think about Albert. I didn't understand everything he was saying, but the fruit, we understood the fruit. Tashiana's husband saw the fruit. And you know what? I believe her son was even revealing fruit to her. Really. Amen. It wasn't just because it was his birthday. Amen. We need to be honest about that, right? So, what have we learned today? What have we learned today? We have learned about religious liberty from a little bit different standpoint than what maybe we're used to hearing, at least for me. This was new to me. Not surprising, but new. Uh, we've learned how to have it. And we've learned how to keep it, have we? Is that clear? The relationship with Christ is the only way, friends. And the commandments of God will come flowing out. Without thinking, we will be able to keep the commandments of God.